So let's start with India's 116 leases, guys. Guys, this is a very interesting standard because it has a significant change from what we learned as far as IGAP AS19 was concerned. AS19 and India's 17 leases were actually more or less in line with each other. But after 2019-20 financial year, or with effective from 1st April 2019, when leases became effective, there's a significant difference in the way lease gets accounted, especially in the books of lessee. It has taken a significant different view or different approach in recognizing a lease in the books of lessee. So this standard India's 116 replaces India's 17 starting from 1st April 2019 onwards. So any enterprise adopting India's starting from India, uh, 1st April 2019 should adopt India's 116 for determination of leases. Now, what is this India's 116 talking about and how do we recognize leases, especially in the books of lessee? Lessor, there is no significant difference. Whatever we have learned as per AS19, I'll repeat once again. But lessee is the one where significant differences have actually occurred. Let's see what we have here. Here we say that according to your India's 116, it applies to all types of leases. It applies to lease of machinery, lease of land, lease of any building. So lease of any kind, either written or oral, whether there is a written lease agreement or an oral lease agreement, shall be applying this particular standard. However, there are certain exclusions from the purview of the standard or from the scope of the standard. What are the exclusions from the scope of the standard? First one, biological assets. Because you have a particular standard called as India's 41, guys, not 40. India's 41, which particularly deals with agriculture, where biological assets are specifically dealt with, they are excluded from the purview of the standard India's 116. Exploration of mineral oils, natural gas, etc., they are governed as per India's 106, which is not uh, related as far as your portion is concerned. But there is a particular index regarding that 104 and 106 both the standards have been eliminated for you both are really important standards as well but however since they are not there in your portion they even your index 116 excludes them because there is a particular standard which deals with them in particular licensing arrangements of motion picture rights manuscripts videos scripts etc these should be excluded because index 38 intangible assets deals with those kind of items license of intellectual property rights is also excluded because it is covered as per india's 38 your service concession agreements is a part of india's 115 your revenue from contracts with customers is also excluded because it is particularly dealt with under india's 115 so these are excluded because they are dealt with under another specific standard clear now Apart from these exclusions, any other lease shall be accounted only as per India's 116. Now, though we talk about exclusions from the score, there are certain exemptions from application itself. There are two types of leases which are exempted from application of India's 116 leases. What are those specific exemptions provided by the standard where the principles of India's 116 of recognition and measurement need not apply. These are short term leases and lease of low value items. Short term leases are leases where the lease term is less than or equal to 12 months. That means not exceeding 12 months. Such kind of leases are called as short term leases. And also the re even if there is a renewable op renewal option for a short term lease, such renewal option is not reasonably certain to occur, then you can call it as a short term lease. Let's say a lease term is for 11 months, but can be extended for furthermore 11 months at the option of the lessee. And the lessee is certain to renew the lease at the end of 11 months, then you cannot call it as a short term lease. So a lease should be less than 12 months and at the same time, it should not have a renewal option. If there is a renewal option, then the renewal is not certain. In such cases, you can claim an exemption 
from recognition of a lease under the standard in DS 116. The second exemption is regarding a lease of low value items. The value of an asset is immaterial. If the value of the asset is immaterial, then you can call it as a lease of low value item. So a lease of an asset which is immaterial in its value is called as lease of low value item. Very small item, even if it is given for 8 years or 10 years of lease, will not be considered under India's 116 you can claim exemption regarding that because these are immaterial leases and giving a treatment, cumbersome treatment of India's 116 will unnecessarily make the entire process much longer. That is the reason why they have excluded this completely. However, this lease of low value item should be independent. That means that asset should not be dependent upon the lease of another item and it cannot be given on sublease to someone. If these conditions are met, that means the value of the lease is uh, asset is immaterial, it is independent, and it is not given on sublease or it cannot be given on sublease. If these three conditions are met, then you can claim exemption from recognizing a lease under India's 116 as a low value item. Clear? So short term leases, lease of low value items are exempted from recognition under India's 116. So what is the recognition for these items then? These items should be recognized as the, these items of lease rentals should be recognized as expense in the books of lessee and income in the books of lessor as and when the payment is falling due. Clear? So no 116 will apply. It doesn't mean that you don't recognize. I recognize. How I recognize? Whatever lease payments are supposed to be paid by the lessee should be treated as expense by the lessee. Whatever lease rentals should be received by the lessor should be recognized as income by the lessor in the period in which they fall due. They fall due quarterly. Make sure that you recognize on quarterly basis. But I will exempt them from application of standard in days 116. Clear? Now, what does in days 116 look into? There are certain definitions, certain parts which we have to talk about and then we will go into the concept of recognition in the books of lessee, recognition in the books of lessor, sale and leaseback, sublease. These are the different parts of the standard. So let's look at the definitions part first. A lease transfers a right to control the asset to the lessee. A lease should transfer right to control the use of asset to a lessee. What do you mean by right to control the use of asset? If a lessee claims to have a right to control the use of the asset, that means he has a right to obtain substantially all the benefits, substantially all the benefits which arise from the use of the asset. That is exclusive right to use the asset over the lease term. And Apart, uh, additional to that, a lessee should have a right to direct the use of the asset. What do you mean by right to direct the use? Right to direct the use means how the asset can be used and for what purpose can the asset be used, both should be decided by the lessee. Then only you say that the lessee has a right to control the use of the asset. This right to control the use of asset is necessary for me to classify any contract as a lease. For me to classify any contract as a lease, a lessee should have a right to obtain maximum economic benefits from the use of the asset or substantially all the benefits from the use of the asset. And he has a right to direct the use of the asset, how and for what purpose the asset can be used. Looks simple. Hmm? Looks very simple. Let me try to complicate it. Let's say for example, a diesel generator set, a diesel generated set, I am not considering it as a low value item, I am considering it as a material item, so you cannot claim exemption under 116, has been taken on lease. That the diesel generator set was installed in the premises of the lessee, was attached to the lessee's premises, so that whenever there is a power failure, the diesel generator set will be applied. 
in such situation the lessee will pay to the lessor a fixed monthly payment and also based on the number of units it's consumed from the diesel generated set the diesel should be applied or diesel cost should be borne by the lessor himself lessee will only utilize it so there are two types of payments he is making one monthly payment for the diesel generator set two for even on the basis of number of units of power consumed from the diesel generator set now can i say can i say that this is a power supply contract rather than a lease answer is no why because number one the diesel generator set is established or installed only in the premises of the customer so other than the customer no one else can take the benefit of it exactly correct absolutely right number two when to use that particular asset depends on the lessee if the lessee has an outage of power or a power failure then he can start using it he can stop using it by shutting down the factory also for that particular period whenever there is a power cut. Let's say it's a scheduled power cut between evening 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the evening. A lessee can simply claim that between 4 to 5 I'll stop the entire production process. A diesel generator set need not be utilized. So how it should be used, for what purpose it should be used, it is the lessee who decides. it. Therefore, you can say that such kind of contracts will fall under the purview of India's 116 and those contracts are of lease. Let's say for example, there is a specialized machinery which is used for fabrication. Okay. Entity X has purchased this machinery, special purpose machinery and have installed very next to an entity Y. Entity Y is using the facility or using the fabrication machine of entity X. It pays on the basis of usage. It pays on the basis of usage. The capacity of X is to, is to fabricate 1000 metric tons per day. Entity Y has a use of entity X's machinery for almost the entire 1000 metric tons a day. However, Y did not tell X that you cannot do it for outsiders. But in general sense, establishing it right next to entity Y, X intends to do only for entity X, uh, entity Y. Now you tell me, does this contract contain a lease or no? Answer is again yes. Because X is not using the machine for anyone else. Can they use? Yes. But substantially all the benefits or majority of the economic benefits from that particular machine will be used only by the entity will be used only by the entity number two entity y asked entity x on how to fabricate how much to fabricate and basically the structure or the design in which they fabricate so how and for what purpose the asset can be used is directed by entity Y. Therefore, since Y takes substantially all the benefits from the asset and Y will direct X on how and for what purpose the asset can be used, you can say that this contract perfectly contains the lease of the asset because entity Y has a right to control the use of asset. Clear? Any
So we have seen this part where we talk about right to control the use of the asset and why, where a contract can be called as whether it contains a lease or not. What is inception of lease and what is commencement of lease and why are they so important to understand first of all. Now why should I know that the, uh, what is the inception of lease and what is commencement of a lease? I'll tell you. Inception of a lease is the date on which inception of lease is the date on which I classify a lease. I identify a lease. I identify a lease on the inception of lease. I recognize a lease on commencement of lease. Oh, inception and commencement are not the same. English Oxford Dictionary, if you look at, actually both will somewhat mean the same. Then how is it so, so different as far as your lease is concerned? That's why you need to look at what, see, basically inception and commencement both mean the same. And what is the difference between a chartered accountant and other than a chartered accountant? Everyone will say commencement of leases, start of lease. Inception of leases, start of lease. That is where chartered accountant will come in and say, no, no, no. Inception and commencement are not the same. So why my knowledge is important to you, I will exhibit. I will tell you. Inception of lease is the date on which you have entered into the lease agreement or the date on which principal provisions of lease are agreed upon. Inception of lease is the date on which I entered into the lease agreement or the date on which the lease agreement or the date on which principal provisions of lease are agreed upon. What do you mean by principal provisions? Let's say for example, I gave you a lease contract of 150 pages. 150 page lease contract I gave you. I threw it on, on your face. I said in 15 minutes, give me a brief of what it contains. What do you do? I'll quickly look at the pages. First thing, what is the asset? For what purpose it can be used? How long is the lease tenure? What is the lease payments? What is the periodicity? Should I pay it monthly, quarterly, annually? What is the increase in lease rentals each year? These are generally the principal provisions which I concentrate upon whenever a lease document is given to me. So the date of lease agreement or the date on which principal provisions of the lease are agreed upon, whichever is earlier of these two should be considered as inception of lease. On the date of inception, I will classify or identify whether the transaction contains a lease or not. Clear? Number two. What is commencement of lease? The date on which the leased asset is made available to the lessee. The date on which the leased asset is made available to the lessee. So the lessee can start using the asset from that particular date is called as commencement of lease. The date on which lessee has a right to control the use of asset is called as commencement of lease. The distinguishment between both is very simple. Let's say for example, I entered into a contract with Mr. X. Mr. X is into manufacturing of commercial vehicles. I entered into a, 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 a contract with Mr. X to lease a commercial vehicle for five years. However, I have asked him to customize the vehicle in a particular manner. Mr. X said he needs three months time to customize the vehicle. I have already sent him the lease contract. He signed the lease contract with a particular date, let's say 1st April 2021. And he said, this asset according to your modifications will be made available to you starting from 1st July 2021. So 1st April 2021, the date on, on which the lease was entered into is called as inception of lease. On 1st July, the asset will be made available to the lessee where the lessee can have a right to control the use of the asset. So from 1st July onwards, you can say that it is a commencement of lease. I recognize the lease. I'll account for lease on 1st July not on 1st April. On 1st April, I will check whether the agreement contains a lease or not. 
and if necessary i will classify the lease that's it after that i my accounting treatment starts only on 1st july when the right to control the use of asset was transferred to the lessee by the lessor this is a significant difference between what is inception of lease and what is commencement of lease so tomorrow you can definitely exhibit your knowledge in front of a client when he says inception and commencement is the same you can tell him that this is a significant difference what is a lease term in colloquial sense the period for which the lessee has a right to control the use of the asset is called as a lease term as simple as that a lease term is a period for which the lessee has a right to control the use of this but again there has to be certain complications to it look at it so he says a lease term is a period for which a non cancellable period for which the lessee acquires a right to control the use of asset from the lessor it is a non cancellable period for which the lessee acquires a right to control the use of asset from the lessor plus in addition with a period for which it can be renewed a period for which it can be renewed if it is reasonably certain that the lessee will exercise his renewal option okay lease term is a non cancellable period for which the lessee acquires a right to control the use of asset from the lessor plus together with the period for which the lease can be extended if it is reasonably certain that the lessee will extend the lease plus a cancellable period if it is reasonably certain that the the lessee will terminate the lease what do you mean by this you should give at least 6 months notice for me to terminate the lease so what happens here if it is reasonably certain that the lessee will terminate the lease but still he has to use the asset for 6 months period that is called as cancellable period the period for which the lessee will continue to use the asset until their lease is cancelled if it is not certain that they will terminate the lease here so i am saying it is a period for which the lessee acquires a right to control the use of the asset plus a period for which the lease can be extended if it is reasonably certain that the lessee will extend the lease plus a period non uh, for a cancellable period that is a period for which the lessee has to use the uh, asset until the lease is terminated i'll give you one more if a lease can be terminated by either parties unilaterally either party means lessee or the lessor if either the lessee or the lessor can unilaterally cancel a lease contract without paying a compensation to the other party a unilaterally i can cancel the lease without paying any damages to the other party then the lease period cannot be determined it cannot be accounted as per indias 116 it should go into the account as short term leases only because you cannot determine the lease period either of the party either lessor or lessee depending on their mood they can cancel of the lease therefore a lease term is a sum of together all combination non cancellable period for which the lessor uh, uh, grants to the lessee right to control the use of the asset plus the period for which the lease can be renewed if it is reasonably certain that the lessee will exercise his renewal right or cancellable period if it is reasonably certain that the lessee will terminate the contract but has to use the asset for certain time until the lease is terminated together is called as lease term what is lease payment sir lease payment means a fixed and a periodic lease payments which they have to make fixed and periodic lease payments are nothing but 
a certain amount which has to be paid at the end of each month or each quarter or at the end of each year annually quarterly half yearly or monthly payments fixed payments which are supposed to be made reduced by any lease incentives which are offered these incentive means basically if you utilize the period uh, if you use that particular asset for beyond one year period of time and you have been continuously meeting the deadline of 10th of each month then from next month onwards pay 2000 less incentive offered to the lessee so that he pays a lesser amount than actually the promised amount is called as lease incentive third one variable lease payments which are based on a rate or an index what is this rate or an index it means let's say i said the machinery which i have given to you supplies power the power will be determined based on the rate of uh, you know the electricity board so electricity board sets out a particular index based on which the lessor charges the lessee a particular fees every month they are variable because the board she keeps on changing the index if the cha index changes automatically your lease payment also changes so such kind of variable lease payments which are based on a particular rate or an index will also be included within lease, lease payments penalty which is payable at the termination of the lease if the lease is not reasonably certain to be renewed i am estimating that this lease will be terminated it is reasonably certain that i will terminate the lease but at the time of termination of the lease i am supposed to pay a compulsory value a termination value that penalty for termination is also included within lease payments if it is reasonably certain for the lease to be terminated lastly guaranteed residual value what is this guaranteed residual value i will take it up later on Pocket aside, I will tell you what is residual value, what is guaranteed, what is unguaranteed, who gives a guarantee, how many guarantees can be given, we will discuss about that. So fixed and periodic lease rentals, less all lease incentives, variable lease payments which are dependent upon a rate or an index, penalty for termination of a lease if it is reasonably certain for the lease to be terminated. Lastly, guaranteed residual value. This combination is called as lease payment. There are certain exclusions from lease payments. There is a non-lease component in a contract which should not be considered as a part of lease payment. What are this non-lease component? I give you a machine on lease. At the end of each six months, I have to replace certain components of the machine. Whenever I replace the components of a machine, I will bill you and you have to pay me for that charges. These repairs, these renewals, any scheduled maintenance which has to be performed and the lessor does the rescheduled maintenance, lessee pays to the lessor the particular charge. These are non-lease components. It is a repair charge. It is a maintenance charge. It is not lease charges. Here they should be excluded from lease contract or variable lease payments which are not based on any rate or index. It is variable lease payments based on utilization. I utilized 100 units this month. I will charge 100 units into particular. Next year, next month, there are huge power cuts. I use 250. Then automatically it is variable based on the usage of the lessee. It is not variable based on a rate or an index. Clear? So I am saying fixed and periodic lease rentals, reduced by lease incentives, variable lease payments which are based on a particular rate or an index, penalty for termination of the contract if it is reasonably certain that the lease will be terminated, guaranteed residual value. It excludes all payments for non-lease elements which are non-lease components which are not covered under the contract provide, paid by the lessee to the lessor or any variable lease payments which are not dependent upon any rate or index. 
this is my discussion regarding lease payments which i have not done with because i still have to cover the concept of your guaranteed residual value Let's move further guys. Yes, what is a guaranteed residual value? What is a residual value? What is a guaranteed residual value? What is an unguaranteed residual value? How many types of guarantees can be given? A residual value means, I'm talking about residual value, RV. It is the fair value of the leased asset it is the fair value of a leased asset at the end of the lease term. Lease term is 5 years. At the end of the 5th year, what is the fair value of the leased asset? The leased asset is 5 years old. So, what is the fair value of the leased asset at the end of the lease term is called as residual value. But, since the lessee himself is using the asset for 5 years period, lessor offers to the lessee. Why don't you buy the asset at the end of the lease term? After 5 years, you buy the asset. Fair value is 100 rupees. I will give it to you at 60 rupees. Take it. Buy. Will he buy? That is dependent. But such value at which the lessee can acquire the leased asset at the end of the lease term is called as guaranteed residual value. Let's say, for example, Lessee said, I don't want to buy. Now, someone will ask me, sir, what if lessor is asking for 120 rupees, not 100? Then lessee obviously won't buy. See, if it is less than fair value only, he will buy. If it is more than fair value, he will say, Ram Ramji, I don't want to buy your asset anymore. So, you need to understand a guaranteed residual value is always less than residual value. I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Let's say you have written an exam. Hmm? ICA has circulated a questionnaire for you asking you what are your expected marks in each exam hmm? and he said take a total of 800 marks of the 8 subjects that you have written and give me a number on how much you are expected. You thought you did fairly well. You thought fairly well 450 is something which I am expecting. But I see I put up a clause. If you fill up the questionnaires and if you don't get exactly the same marks or if you get less than that marks, you will not write CA final again. You will not write CA final again. So, you tell me how much are you going to write in that question? Will you write 450? Will you write 400 at least? Or will you write 100? Or will you write 2 on? How much will you write? If I was there, I would have written 100 on. Or if possible is, possibility is there, I will write 10 on. Because I don't know with certainty what I will get. Fairly, I should get 400 plus. But I don't know. But you are, since you are asking me to give a guarantee, saying that below this I won't get. 
then I have to give you a guarantee of much lower amount. I can never give you a guarantee for more than that. So therefore, you need to understand that guaranteed residual value. If someone is guaranteeing you, then obviously he'll give it at less than residual value. Less than fair value only he'll give. The difference between the fair value of the asset and the guaranteed residual value of the asset, the difference is called as unguaranteed residual value. Let's say fairly, I think I will get 450 on 800, but I wrote as a guarantee 200. Then the difference of 250 is called as unguaranteed residual value. Now, should the guarantee be received by the lessor only from the lessee is the question. Answer is no. Let's say for example, I have taken a bus on uh, I purchased a bus and I've given it to a travels on hire, on lease. The travels person has taken it for three year lease. At the end of the third year, the travels fellow is saying, I don't want to buy your bus. You take your bus. I said, what will I do with the bus? I can't go to my place of work every day on a bus. I need a car for that, not a bus. So I have to find potentially who is ready to take over a second hand bus. I identified a school. I went to the school and I told him new bus is there, which is right now out on lease for three years. At the end of three years, once the lessee leaves the asset, I will deliver it to you. You purchase the asset at the end of three years. School fellow said, why should I buy? New bus, sir. New bus is one crore. Three years later, old bus also, if you take easily 50 lakhs. But this is said, if you give me a guarantee today, I'll give it to you at 35 lakhs. Take it. 30% discount I'm giving. Then, in such cases, the guarantee to the lessor was not given by the lessee. The guarantee was given by a third party. So, a lessor can receive a guarantee for a, for a leased asset. To purchase the leased asset at the end of the lease term, either the lessee can give a guarantee or a third party can give a guarantee. Guaranteed residual value is always less than residual value. The difference between the residual value and guaranteed residual value is called as unguaranteed residual value. There, 